I mean, great turnout. I don't know whether it's whether I should be nervous or not because I'm an agronomist dressed up as a plant pathologist. <laughs> so you know, look the story about the emperor with no clothes. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so the title of this talk, uh, essentially, I'm going to talk on the effect of crop rotation on disease in a long-term no-till trial. I'd like to acknowledge my uh, co-authors um, in this, and that's Daniel Huberley, Sarah Collins, Phil Ward, and Neil, Co uh, Neil Cordy. So uh, we've all been working uh, very closely together on this. So just to give you a bit of background, the overall objective of this trial was to understand the effects of crop rotation and residue retention on the soil crop production, diseases, etc, etc. We, we looked at insects and so on. But in this talk, I'm just focusing on the disease aspects. And I should emphasize it's in, in a no-till system. So let's get on to the trial itself. Um, it's a trial that was started in 2007, and it's been going, uh, and it's still currently going. But the results I'll show you today are up to 20, 2015. It's a trial that's funded by the GRDC. It's been funded for uh, those years, and at the end of this year, it will be 12 years, and we're resampling again this year. So the trial is situated at the Cumberland College of Agriculture. It's on a red sandy clay loam soil, and the plots are quite large. So we've got uh, 36 meters by 80 meters, and we have five main treatments. Okay, and uh, they are three year rotations, and we've got three reps in there. So you can see the size of it, it's, it's fairly large. From one end to the, to the other is 800 meters, so nearly a kilometer, and you can see all the plots lined up there. The two plots at the end here, uh, they look fairly large, are those, those are one hectare plots. We've got some bone ratio equipment in there for measuring evapotranspiration. So these are the five treatments we've got. We've got a serial rotation, and essentially that serial, serial, serial. You know, I mentioned earlier that they're three-year rotations. So we can include in there any of those cereals, like wheat, oats, barley, and we have every phase of the rotation presented every year. So we have, in every year, we'll have a plot of wheat and an oats and a barley, if that's, those are the three rotations. So that's a serial rotation. Then we have a diverse rotation. We've called that diverse rotation because it goes from cereal, a legume, into a brassica. And again, we have all of those crops presented every year. Then I've called it a farmer rotation, which is essentially cereal dominated, so two cereals, and then a break. And for the first few years, we had legume in there, and recently we've had fallow in there as that break. So uh, still cereal dominated, but a, a break in there. Then we have, sort of call it two control plots, a monoculture wheat, so continuous wheat, and then permanent pasture. In that permanent pasture, we seeded uh, clover in there, subterranean clover. I think we started off with Dalkeith, I think it was, and then a couple of years later, we seeded um, some medic, and also Nungaran clover. And then we've got rye grass, other grasses in there, barley grass, there's some broadleaf weeds in there as well. So it's a mixture. It is uh, got quite strong legume in there, but it's a mixture of grasses and broadleaf weeds and uh, those uh, legumes. So those are the five treatments, cereal, diverse, farmer, <coughs> monoculture, and the, and the pasture. Just um, show you what crops we actually had in there. Um, so starting in 2007, uh, I've put them in sort of three, year, um, three years together because it was a three year rotation. And so we kept the same crops for three years. And then we, if the definition allowed us, we could then change the crops. So the first three years here, we had an, an oats as a cover crop, barley, barley, then wheat, 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 and then wheat, wheat, barley. The diverse rotation, we had wheat, it was then mainly vetch with some oats in there, so vetch was the legume, so cereal legume, brassica was canola. Next year, wheat, field pea canola, and then wheat, chickpea canola. 
and the next three years, uh, which was after 2015, incidentally, here we've got wheat, uh, albus, lupin, and canola. So we've gone wheat, lupin, canola again. It's a heavy red soil, slightly alkaline, and hence uh, we've gone to the albus lupin. The farmer rotation is essentially been wheat and barley, so wheat, barley, lupin, wheat, barley, field pea, and wheat, barley, fallow. And the next three years here is wheat, barley, fallow. Um, monoculture wheat, obviously just uh, straight wheat. Now I've got a line up here because in 2010 uh, we split the plots for high residue and low residue. The high residue treatment, we cut the, the crop but with a commercial harvest and we spread all the residue. In the low residue subplots, we actually cut it very low and we windrow burned it. So we reduced the residue by 40 to 60 percent. So we had a high and low residue. There was still residue in there. So if you look here, you can see on this side of the split was the retain or spread all the residue, the high residue, uh, where it was cut and spread. And this is the low residue. So you can see there that we've got less residue in there. And we measurements showed between 40 to 60 percent less residue here, but there's still stubble on the surface there. So that was windrow burning. Okay, so let's get on to the uh, research hypothesis. A pretty basic high-level hypothesis was that disease and nematode levels would be increased by the continuous cereal or the monoculture wheat compared to the diverse rotations. Um, in terms of the methods, we did measure foliar diseases working with uh, deep herd as well. Uh, so we but we mainly focused on the wheat and barley, and so we measured the foliar diseases over a number of years. Um, we measured those foliar diseases over a number of years. I should emphasize we didn't measure the canola diseases um, because we only had the one canola crop in there. In terms of the uh, soil and root diseases, we've been uh, mainly focusing on the predictor bead. So the predictor B is a soil DNA analysis where it's an analysis of the soil pathogens using uh, DNA techniques. And um, you can see here we've got the Broadacre Soilborne Disease Manual that's uh, produced by uh, the predictor B. And the objective here of that soil DNA analysis really is to assess the preceding levels of the, of the pathogen DNA there, and to assign a risk category for the next crop that you're growing, so whether it's a high risk or low risk. And that's the objective, I think, of, of the predictor B analysis. They do emphasize in the manual that that risk level that's assigned to it, it, it may or may not happen, um, and that's a function, obviously, of the pathogen DNA, um, the environmental conditions, what management you apply, and what crops, obviously, you decide to grow in there, if it's resistant, etc. How did we do the soil sampling? Um, this is taken from that same manual that uh, produced uh, the predictor B manual, essentially in a W pattern, uh, and we did 25 soil samples per plot. Uh, using the recommended Cora, uh, which is essentially taking the top 10 centimeters of soil. Uh, what does that predict to be um, actually measure? Uh, there's the list there. Uh, the main cereal diseases, particularly uh, Rhizotonia, Takeal, Arfusarium, uh, Crown Rot, uh, Root Lesion Nematode, Stem Nematode, Black Spot and Peas. Common root rot, Pythium, Phytophthora, and yellow leaf spot. So we got the DNA analysis uh, across all of those. Okay, so what measurements did we actually, I'm, I'm going to present today? So, firstly, we did the predictor B, as I say, to identify the soil borne path pathogens. Uh, we did preceding uh, soil samples, and we did it in 2007 before the start of the experiment. And then I'm going to present results today as well. 
at the end, after in March 2016. Um, so basically that was after nine years of those different crop rotations. So we'll look at the change from 2007 to 2016 of key seeding. In 2016, we also went into the crop itself, and at stem elongation of the wheat, we went through all of the plots, and we dug plants up, and uh, got the soil from around the roots. So we did a soil uh, DNA around the roots, so that's, uh, that's like the rhizosphere soil. And we also uh, took root samples from those plants and sent them to see how much uh, of the pathogen were actually in the roots themselves. And that's, I'll be presenting that today. I've drawn a line there as well because we did do, uh, working with uh, Deep Herd, um, Sarah Collins and, and Daniel from, from the department, uh, we, we did a whole series of visual assessments as well of rhizotonia incidence, severity of root rot and so on, but I won't present those today. Okay, in terms of the growing season, what, uh, what, what's happened there at that Cunderdon site? Plotted the rainfall over time. Um, that red line there is the average, 20 year average uh, for Cunderdon airfield. And what you can see, the main point there is that it's been, there's been a lot of dry seasons through there, particularly 2007, 2010, we actually had just under 100 millimeters of growing season rainfall, 2012 was also dry. So a predominance of, uh, of dry seasons in there. And that, that may have had some effect on the results uh, because obviously in wet seasons, much better growth and more multi multiplication of your uh, pathogens and nematodes. So we'll go on to the findings. In terms of the crop residue management, because I, I said I was going to talk about that, uh, essentially all I'm going to say there is that uh, from our data, uh, we uh, concluded that the crop residue management, that was the windrow burning versus keeping all the residue, had little effect on, on the diseases, so that's the leaf, root, or sawborne diseases. And as I say, canola wasn't um, measured in this, uh, in this case. Um, I see there's a recent paper that um, I think um, Mike Ashworth, Kyle, can't remember his surname, but they published something saying that windrow burning did reduce canola um, levels, but I'm not sure if they actually measured it in the field or just showed that those techniques uh, reduced it. But we found that the Windrow burning, reducing the residue by uh, 40 to 60 percent, had no effect on disease levels. So I'm not really going to say any anything more about residue, um, and we'll now focus just on the rotation side. So the first set of results I'll present are um, where we look, we measured it preceding in 2007 and preceding again in 2016. So the first set of data I'll present is the difference between 2016 compared to 2007. So obviously if it's below the zero line, it's decreased. If it's above, um, it's gone up since 2007. So firstly, in the terms of the black spot, uh, and this is the change, and there's the zero, you can see clearly where we've had the uh, serial rotation. It's gone significantly down. Farmer rotation, which had two cereals and one break, um, it's gone down. So um, even though we have had a field pea in there, um, the break seems to be reasonably effective. The monoculture and then the diverse rotation, which had an extra field, it had uh, a field peas in there, um, it is slightly higher. But that's sort of what we'd expect. Cereals uh, are not going to proliferate or, or increase that disease. In terms of crown rot, um, I'm sorry, I should say if a net is above it, it's showing significance at uh, 0.05. Uh, in terms of crown rot, uh, increase where the cereals are, and then uh, and also in the monoculture wheat, for some reason we, we're seeing, tending to get more disease where we've got continuous cereals, so we've had uh, quite a bit of barley in there as well as the wheat, whereas this is uh, monoculture wheat. But Still looking at the variability, no significant difference there. And clearly the diverse rotation uh, much less in there. So that's 
what we would expect in terms of crown rot. Uh, rhizotonia, uh, rhizotonia bear patch. Again, I've got no lettuce up there because there was a lot of variability in the data, so no significance, but still you can see that the serial dominated rotations are still showing higher levels of rhizotonia. Okay, when we come to Pythium, um, you'll see here that actually Pythium has decreased in all the serial dominated rotations, including the pharma rotation, which has two serials. Um, but you'll see that Pythium has increased in the diverse rotation, and it's also increased in the pasture. Uh, root lesion nematode had a similar result, where with the root lesion nematode, um, which is Pratolenchus neglectus, a significant increase in the diverse rotation, and there was also high numbers in the pasture as well. And the lowest was in the cereal and the farmer rotation, which was a bit of a surprise to me. Okay, so what I've shown you there is just the difference between the 2016 and 2007. So it's hard to gauge, obviously, actually how much do we have in the soil because it's just showing the difference. So I'd like to now present just some data from 2016. What have we got in the soil now? And we'll start off just looking at the preceding levels uh, that we measured in 2016. So what I'm showing you now are a number of the diseases, and I've got the five ro different uh, rotation treatments up there. And uh, firstly, looking at black spot, it's as we would expect. We've grown black spot. We've had uh, peas in the diverse rotation, so much higher there and very low levels uh, where we haven't grown it. So there's, that's fitting in nicely. Common root rot, um, we've basically levels are very low anyway. So even after um, we've had in there, th this is this is the. When we measured this, we would have had nine years of cereal in there and still uh, virtually no root rot in there. In terms of crown rot, and significantly more crown rot um, where we have the cereals, same as we found earlier, and low levels um, or none really detectable in the diverse rotation. The farmer rotation is also doing pretty well there because that has two cereals and then the break. So maybe the fallow is doing particularly well there. I've put up here, the, these are the risk level. Um, that, that, that means uh, that's at a low risk. So anything below three, uh, it's hard to detect, but three to 99 picograms per gram of DNA is considered a low level, and much higher than that, um, then the risk goes higher. So, we're still at pretty low levels of crown rot. Um, that's measured preceding. Uh, rhizotonia, again, um, higher in the serial dominated rotations. And I've put up here the, the risk level. So 2 to 49 is low risk. So again, from our preceding measurements, um, it seems that it's all at low risk. <coughs> Uh, pythium, uh, again, significantly higher pythium where we have the diverse rotation and the pasture and lower with the serial dominated rotations. Um, just uh, as a non-pathologist talking, just doing some reading around that, it does appear that um, this is not... Uh, having this is, doesn't mean that uh, in the future <coughs> sort of is we're going to end up with low levels of pythium that uh, the pythium species can basically we can uh, favor different pythium species so the pythium that's favored in cereals could build up but at the moment uh, we're finding relatively low levels. A take all is another one very low levels of take all you can see that with the risk level we essentially very low. Yellow leaf spot uh, DNA co the copies 
Um, that fits in nicely with how much cereal we've grown. You can see in the monoculture wheat, uh, that's 70,000, 150,000 here. Um, and then the farmer rotation where we've got two cereals, 27, and then um, and 50 there. So um, that's fitting in quite nicely with, with the cereal. So we've got high, much higher levels with the continuous cereals. Um, I put up this because it just shows um, within, um, although we have low levels in the diverse rotation in the monoculture, sorry, the farmer rotation, um, let's just have a look and see how it drops. So looking at yellow leaf spot uh, DNA here, in the diverse rotation, you can see high levels with the, with the wheat, and every subsequent crop after that that's non-wheat, you see levels dropping. It's interesting as well, where we have the farmer rotation, how effective that fallow seems to be as well um, in dropping uh, levels of yellow leaf spot DNA. Serial cyst nematode, virtually none there. And uh, I believe that a lot of the varieties are, are fairly tolerant to serial cyst nematode. And also there's some evidence to show that under zero till, um, that serial cyst nematodes are also much lower. Pratlenchus neglectus, uh, the root lesion nematode. Um, in 2016, levels are again highest uh, where we have the diverse rotation in the pasture and lowest in the farmer rotation. And for the risk, the uh, level associated with that was 0.3 to 2 picograms. So, um, in the diverse rotation, we're in the medium risk category, so it it's, has uh, gone up. It's considered reasonably high. Here. And I think the medium is somewhere around 2 to 15, so we're in that medium category uh, in the diverse rotation. A stem nematode, no stem nematode <coughs> detected, um, which I believe is good because it's not supposed to be in the state of <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, these results I was showing here, we're just looking at the overall uh, rotations. What I'd like to do now is just to see, uh, focus on, on two of the diseases, probably our main diseases, Rhubnesia nematode and Rhizotonia. And let's look within those rotations at the individual crops within those rotations and see where, uh, which crops are building up and which crops are not building up there. And I'll present uh, preceding uh, analysis results and also in crop um, results. So just starting off there with the preceding, okay, so shown by there, so that we sampled there before seeding the 20, 2016 crop. It was done in March 2016. And I've got the root uh, lesion nematode uh, levels up here. And these are the the rotation, cereal, diverse, farmer, monoculture, and these are the three crops uh, in that rotation. But remember these, so this is March 2016, so the crops I'm showing here is actually the stubble from the last year. Okay, so this is, this is the stubble from last year. Let's go first of all to the diverse rotation. Um, you can see here clearly that um, with the root lesion nematode, where we had canola last year, levels were pretty high. The line I've drawn there was the low risk line. Um, uh, so uh, we, we're in, in the medium risk. The wheat is also, wheat after canola particularly, uh, very high levels. And also chickpea is susceptible as well. So uh, all three of those crops that were grown in the previous season, and so that was the stubble that we sampled into, uh, in that diverse rotation, we're building up nematode levels. The rest are cereal dominated, and they're all around uh, here, so we can see reasonably high levels here. Uh, the fallow, again, seems to be quite effective, and, uh, you know, overall in this rotation, there's, compared to the continuous cereal, that fallow is definitely uh, that break is definitely having an effect. But there clearly is the reason why um, we've got higher levels of rubbish nematode. So this is the pre, 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 um, preceding. 
Um, in 2016, we then seeded the next crop, and we went into that crop and actually did the sampling at around um, that stem elongation stage. And so you'll see the crops have now all changed, okay? Because now I'm showing you the nematode that's actually in that crop in the next year. So look at the diverse rotation here. Uh, when we in the canola there, very high levels. Uh, in the wheat as well, and lupin low levels. So the lupin has done pretty well. And this is in the soil, uh, in that rhizosphere soil. So uh, lupin um, has decreased the levels quite considerably if you think that both other crops are very susceptible. So the lupin is quite tolerant. Um, you can see in this farmer, you know, how effective that, um, that system is with the fallow in there. And then we've got moderate, moderately high levels with the continuous cereal and the monoculture. Now, we, I'm showing you the same uh, sets of crops, but now we've actually taken the roots from those crops and got them analyzed as well. And um, you can see again in the diverse rotation, very high levels in the wheat and the canola, and actually in the loop, in the loop and roots itself, um, virtually none in there. So showing again the um, tolerance or uh, resistance of the lupin to root lesion nematode, but the canola and the wheat particularly affected. And what's interesting here is that the wheat in that system seems to be very, very high, even compared to the um, the monoculture wheat and the wheat in these other systems there. Um, now looking at the last uh, of the diseases is the rhizoctonia. And going back now and uh, let's look at the samples preceding. So we're now sampling into the stubble before we've planted the next crop. And looking at the rhizoctonia um, it's the AG8 uh, group. In the diverse rotation, clearly rhizoctonia, much higher following wheat stubble, uh, relatively low following canola stubble um, and chickpea. And where we've got the continuous cereals, uh, wheat and, and barley quite high, uh, high here. Again, the fellow is doing a great job. Uh, in that soil preceding, um, there was actually zero um, rhizoctonia in there, and that's obviously keeping it down in that uh, system. <coughs> so now going into the next, into the crop after we've planted, and again the crops have changed, and now so we're going into the actual crop itself, not looking at what came before that. In the diverse rotation, showing that rhizoctonia is significantly higher in the wheat, lupin and canola, pretty tolerant to the rhizoctonia. Uh, for some reason in the cereal, we found very high levels in the barley, um, re reasonable in, in the wheat, and uh, again, low levels uh, in, in the farmer rotation, which has that fallow in there. So this, over the years, this is obviously Having a fallow in there, and then we've grown lupins in there, um, actually has uh, worked pretty well. The actual roots themselves um, of, of those different crops, um, we're finding a lot, there's no lettuce here because there's a lot of variability, but again, uh, predominating, uh, you know, high with the cereals. So, Looking at our hypothesis, disease and nematode levels would be increased by continuous cereals and wheat monoculture compared to the diverse rotation that was confirmed, certainly for fusarium crown rot and rhizotonia, but not the case for root lesion nematode or pythium. And in summary, fusarium uh, crown rot, rhizotonia, favored by the cereal dominated rotations, root lesion nematode and pythium were much more prevalent in the pasture and the diverse rotations. And just a point I, I put up here, uh, we obviously need to select more disease and resistant crops. That probably sounds 
common sense, but um, I think even within our crop types, we need to be very careful about um, the resistance levels within those crops and selecting cultivars that uh, are, are more resistant. So in this trial, um, we've been selecting our cultivars based on agronomics, you know, our yield potential, and, um, and, and also weeds, some of the crops uh, cultivars have gone in there we've selected that have tolerance to herbicides and we haven't really thought much about what's going on in the soil and so you can see that certainly I don't know if there are tolerant canola varieties to uh, root lesion nematode but if there were oh, clearly we need to be uh, looking at, at that so I suppose with the message that well one of the things that I really learned was we need to be very careful about selecting cultivars uh, within our crop type and not just focus on one aspect like weeds, because we can potentially be building up um, pathogens as well. Um, that's all I have. Excellent talk, lots of data. We open straight away for well, questions. It wasn't completely on top of your design, but you had every phase of each rotation in every year, is that right? Yes. So could you... Uh, without stats, do some sort of pathogenicity test by saying, I'll oh, look at all the wheat crops from the different rotation. I mean, you've got wheat in every rotation and it's there in every yeah. year, so you could go in in any year and compare wheat mm -hmm. yields. Mm -hmm. um, um, we could do that, but one of the things that it's like clear, like for root leaves and nematode, that wheat in that diverse rotation is, seems to be much, much more susceptible maybe susceptible is the wrong word, but much higher level. So what's happening the year before and the year before that is having a big influence in terms of root lesion nematode. And I here I believe from the pathologists that with rhizoctonia you don't necessarily get that longer lasting effect. So um, I think, you know, as I say, with the wheat, the wheat in the in the diverse rotation was very, very was significantly higher than the wheat grown in the, in the uh, continuous cereals, for example. Even though it was the same variety, we've grown the same variety every year within a year. So the yields, the yields vary by buggery, or they that's a good much. question. So, <laughs> and that that's the difficulty is the yields are mainly driven by soil moisture. Mm. So. Um, you know, and where we might be seeing it is maybe um, in the um, in the wet years, mm. and uh, it, that may be one reason why the farmer rotation is coming out pretty well in the wet years, and maybe the diverse rotation I would have expected to be higher than it actually is, and you know maybe there's some disease effect in there. Um, that we haven't really picked up. Yeah. Yes, well, well, oh yes, yes, please go to your question. Then you can, um, what is the fallow treatment in the sense of how is that fallow uh, maintained? Is that a burnt um, no, so, or um, um, it's sprayed? Yes, um, so essentially uh, it's a chemical fallow, mm. so the stubble is kept there. And um, we uh, will we'll spray it when obviously some weeds germinate, and um, so there is a weed presence in there. Um, but we'll try and keep on top of it by spraying. So relatively clean fallow, a uh, chemical fallow using herbicides. So little in the way of grasses there compared, say, with the pastures. Correct. Uh, Correct. And um, the other thing is, uh, when we have. We, that fallow is split, so half of it we're actually uh, using a tillage in there as well. Oh. Yeah. Okay, but this isn't, the results I'm presenting here are not on the tilled section. Yeah. Um, Ken, I had a, a comment actually, because Anne's taking my question. Sorry. So that's okay. <laughs> Um, but my comment was uh, the Adelaide group that do the predictive bee testing also have a research capability to look at uh, beneficial microorganisms and yeah. the diversity there. I'm just wondering with, with the treatments where you had a disease suppression, yeah. have you considered looking at whether there is a more diverse community there or a larger community? Yeah, no, thanks. Um, 
We, yes, we have. So part of that predict to be, I haven't shown any of the results or, or commented on it. We've had a lot of uh, free living nematodes um, and we're doing a lot of the DNA around the other soil biology in there. Um, and so we've 26, we've got, got a whole lot of data from 2016 and uh, this being the last year of the trial, we're going to go uh, big into that as well and try and see if we can pick up what's happening there because we'd expect much higher levels in the monoculture wheat um, and um, you know, we, we, that, that's, that's a really good point. So we are, we are doing that, so we're working with um, Catherine in, in Saudi to, um, to do that and, and Sarah Collins and Daniel at, at Deepu. So we just had a discussion on that last week. Yeah, we've got this one and then we'll come back. Oh, my question was about the yield. Anyway, you answered that. But the beneficial effect of the diverse preparation following on from there, uh, did you look at that? So, nitrogen or water uh, penetration, etc.? Yeah. yeah. So, we um, Phil, well, I, I can <laughs> handle it. How do you learn an Aussie rule? It's it that way. Um, but uh, so Phil's measuring, uh, you know, soil water using the neutron probe, um, and we have done a we had a PhD study uh, looking at the nitrogen, uh, Nathan Craig, and clearly there's higher nitrogen uh, availability in the in the diverse rotation, and that's something I haven't mentioned uh, at the moment. Uh, certainly, one of the issues with this continuous cereal, but particularly the monoculture wheat, is uh, dropping. Uh, Lower le much lower levels of protein in there. So the nitrogen availability is a big issue. Um, we have tried to uh, actually fertilize it according, you know, to, to keep, we've actually put more nitrogen usually on the monoculture wheat, but we've been uh, underdoing it. So it'll be interesting to look at different nitrogen rates on there um, to see whether it's um, just a a nutrition effect is why we've got lower yields um, because the diseases certainly with uh, root there's higher rhizotonia but it's not it's not at very high levels and um, the monoculture doesn't seem to be that high in terms of disease so it doesn't look like the disease are the big factor there and whether it's a nutrition thing that's um, coming in there and, and causing the lower yields because the proteins seem to indicate and obviously you do some economics of the whole system. Yes, substrate. yes we are. So the, to date the monoculture wheat has been the most economic. Um, but having said that, I would say that the continuous cereal is probably going to um, you know, come out uh, uh, tops because we've got the barley in there and, um, you know, and, and the wheat as well. The diverse rotation, um, we have it every three years and actually uh, sorry, uh, we, we, yeah, it's a three year rotation, but um, the diverse rotation is both the most profitable and the least profitable in the sense that we have, because we have three plots one grows wheat, one grows uh, the legume, and one grows the canola, and then the wheat plot becomes the legume, etc. So one of those plots is the most profitable, and one is the least profitable. And it's purely where we had a drought, where we're growing a canola, we lost a lot of money. Uh, where we had a drought and we had the cereal, the next year we might have had a good year and we had the wheat, um, sorry, we had the canola, um, you know, that's become the most profitable. So it's potentially the most profitable, but also potentially the least profitable. And that's why with the predominance of dry seasons, those with most cereals have been the most profitable. Did you want to add your question? Yeah, I think it was more or less answered. It was about the continuous um, wheat. And I was surprised that the levels of pretty much all of the diseases were lowest, or relatively low, they yeah. suggesting suppressive conditions. But that's exactly, so that's what we were talking about, yeah. and Fran raised that point, is that you know it seems like something is going on there. And I think because we, yeah, uh, we did predict to be in 2013 as well, so I haven't presented all the results. We've got a lot of data there, 
and uh, and the Saudi analysis has been expanding as well in terms of the um, their capacity to analyze some of the other microbes in the soil. So um, hopefully that it will get enough information to look at that. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for your clear presentation. I appreciate that this is a part of a bigger project, and I also appreciate that you just gave us a snapshot because there's a lot of data there. I think my first question has been part, pretty much answered. I was initially thinking, oh, geez, maybe we should be thinking more about these, introducing these fallows, but at the same time, <coughs> based on your responses to the yield and economics, it sounds like that, that would be something that you would include. No, the fallow will definitely <laughs> yeah. drive it down. Um, my second question is, this is an amazing data set that you've got here. Um, but not everyone can go out there sampling year in and year out. Are there models available for people to try and help predict what what the risks are? The models, I'm not an expert on it, and Bill will probably shoot me down. But <laughs> so I mean, APSIM is an obvious. It's hard to model that. For Ab disease, for disease. Okay, with disease, um, I don't know. Black spot. Oh, oh, there are black spots and so yeah. on. Um, Yes, but in terms of soil diseases, I, I don't know. Yeah, it'd be interesting if there was um, some models out there, whether, and maybe it's not practical, Mark and someone else might. Yeah. It's, it, I mean, it'd be great to work alongside those people and see how, how your data fits in with their prediction. Yeah. I mean, that that's one of the things with the long-term trials, and I yeah. suppose it's a, a shout-out to Neil Cording from, from one firm who's uh, keeps the database for this. So we have an access database. So um, where everything right from the beginning of the trial, including all the economic data and prices plus things, everything is in that database. So that data could be made available to anyone. Um, you know, and so keeping that data in that sort of the format that's available is, is key. Awesome. Awesome. It's a very question and session. We go with Georgia and then Phil and Wallace. Hi. Um, they recently changed the crown rock predictor that you needed stubble. I was just wondering if you had stubble in it. Uh, there would have been some stubble, but we didn't focus on the, So we went in and did random 25. Right. And so if it landed on a row, that just went in there. Okay. Uh, if it didn't land on the road, but I, I, I noticed, I think they say that you should actually sample the stubble. Yeah. Because, yeah, uh, that, that may make a difference. We, we just did random samples um, uh, following, the, I think, the original yeah. guidelines. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, just but that is curious a good about that. <laughs> no, I did, re I, I did read that recently, and um, so when we go and redo it, um, so we, we're going to sample this year now in crop. And at the end of the whole trial, which is next year, we're trying to get it refunded, but we, if it finishes next year, uh, we will um, resample everything, um, sort of equivalent to the last preceding one, and, uh, and look at that aspect. So thanks for being here. Yeah. Can okay, just uh, probably quickly, were you surprised at the, the residue treatment didn't have, have an effect? Was that also I, no, I, I wasn't really because there's still quite a bit of residue there, you know. So I, I would say, you know, if it had been very wet years, lots of them, maybe we would have seen an effect. But maybe, maybe the effect is there, but it's just so small, it's not really that significant. But having said that, the windrow burning has had a big effect, well, a noticeable effect on weeds. So there has been a benefit from it, but not in terms of disease. Well, you set up my question nicely. Um, a study in New South Wales reported a couple of years ago said that by including atrazine tolerant canola in the rotation, you were, they were able to control herbicide tolerant ryegrass much more effectively than without the canola. And in fact, that improved the profitability of having canola in the rotation. So, do you have any comments on herbicide tolerant, uh, especially ryegrass, in yeah. these rotations? So. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we in terms of the canola, we actually we started off using the, the TT canolas, and uh, we then gone on to the Roundup Ready. But we, you know, we make a decision if weeds are building up, then we, in the next three years, we could switch back to 
to your TT. So um, we've had no problems really managing resistance in the diverse rotation. We have had a problem with managing weeds in the diverse rotation because particularly in the legumes, we've been struggling to get good weed control. And that's then carried on to the wheat. Um, so that, that's one comment. The big problem with weeds has been in the monoculture wheat, uh, where weed numbers are just building up and building up. Um, so we got on top of that by using clear field wheat, and that's hammered the wheat. So we've got very low level again, and so we're going back to normal wheat now. So that, that was a, a call. Yeah. Um, can I slowly indicate this is a large project and it's about the data, a lot of uh, information to get out of this. Uh, but you answered the question to say yield is uh, more or less driven by uh, soil moisture. And you only presented the disease data, and how do you know the disease changes are not driven by the soil moisture? I would say there's much less disease because the soil moisture has been relatively dry. So, you know, if we had 10 years of wet seasons, the disease profiles could be quite different. But one of the findings for me was in terms of the root lesion nematode. Um, unexpected. The other ones like Rhizoctonia, Crown Rot, we'd expect those to be higher in the cereals. So uh, I would just say that maybe the levels are relatively low because of the dry seasons. And the other comment is it's on, on reasonably heavy soil, red soil. Um, the question would be on the sandy soil, um, would things fall apart a lot easier? Okay, one question. Thank you. Well, please join the same.